Today on A Daily Walk, consider this question with us. Friends, let me ask you this morning, in face of opposition of this world, can they see that we have been with Jesus? Is Jesus able to get through? Are they seeing it? Is it clear to this world? Can they identify something different about you? And what's different about you is you've been with Jesus. Can they see it? Well, we're glad you've joined us for A Daily Walk and our continuing study of Acts. On today's program, we enter chapter four. In this section of scripture we're looking at today, Peter has just given a God-inspired evangelistic sermon to a group of people who have observed a miraculous healing of a lame man. Thousands of people ended up surrendering their lives to God. And one might expect that joy would abound. Everyone would be excited by the news. But that wasn't the case. There was a group of religious leaders who were greatly disturbed by this. Pastor John Randall will draw attention to Peter and John's reaction in the midst of this opposition. If you have your Bibles, if you'd open with me this morning to the book of Acts, chapter 4. As we continue our journey through the book of Acts, looking at the early church, this morning we come to the fourth chapter with a message entitled, Facing Opposition. Acts chapter 4, and I want to draw your attention to verse 18 this morning. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. When the power of the Holy Spirit fell upon the early church on the day of Pentecost, their numbers grew dramatically. They went from 120 people in an upper room to over 3,000 in one day. Following this population explosion, the church made it a priority to continue to study the word of God. They continued in the worship of God. They continued to do the work of God and they continued to pray to God. And one day, as Peter and John were going up to the temple to pray, they came across a 40-year-old crippled man that had never walked a day in his life. And he was sitting by the beautiful gate, and he was begging for money. The disabled man asked Peter and John for money, and Peter responded to his request by saying, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And immediately and instantly, the crippled man was healed. And he began walking and leaping and praising God. Suddenly, the crowd recognized the man and knew that it was the same beggar who sat outside. But now he was miraculously healed. The people then gathered round Peter and John. And Peter began to preach the life-saving message of the gospel, and many people were saved. Yet in the midst of this miraculous moment, Peter and John, for the first time in their ministry, were confronted with opposition. Jesus had told his disciples in advance that this day would eventually come, that they would be hated. If they hated Jesus, it was only a matter of time before they despised his followers. And when the disciples had preached to the people and people were getting saved, the Bible says in Acts chapter four, beginning in verse one, that they were arrested. It says, as they spoke to the people that the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And so they laid hands on them and they put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. There were three groups of people that came and arrested Peter and John. There were the priests, first of all. They were in charge of the worship service in the temple, making sure that the people kept the law of God. And then there was the captain of the temple who provided the security that was necessary in the temple areas. And finally, there was a group called the Sadducees. When I was a little boy, we used to sing a song and the lyrics said, I don't want to be a Sadducee because they are sad, you see. 
The Sadducees were a very powerful political group cloaked in religious activity. And although they were a minority among the people, they controlled the political and religious life of the people. They were the materialistic rationalists of their day. They denied the supernatural. They denied the existence of evil spirits. They denied angels. They believed that God was utterly remote, removed from his people, leaving a person to craft his or her own fate. They believed in a divine hands-off policy. And above all, they denied the resurrection from the dead, which was the very message that the apostles were boldly preaching. You see, the Sadducees only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament. And they couldn't find a passage of scripture that spoke of an afterlife and a resurrection in those first five books. And so they dismissed it altogether. In Matthew's gospel, you may recall during the ministry of Jesus, that the Sadducees confronted Jesus on the very subject of the resurrection. They presented what they felt was an irrefutable argument. But Jesus silenced their ignorance by saying that they were mistaken and they did not know the scriptures nor the power of God. And then Jesus quoted from the second book of the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, that said that that was one of the books that they believed in. And he pointed to the burning bush passage when God spoke to Moses. And do you remember what he said? Jesus quoted it in Matthew 22, verse 32, when he said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus did not say, I was the God of Abraham. May he rest in peace. I was the God of of Isaac. Tragically, he passed away and no longer exists. He said, I am implying that they were still alive and that there was a resurrection. Why would the Sadducees get so upset with the message of the gospel? The gospel message is rooted in the love of God. It provides forgiveness of sin through the blood of Christ and the hope of eternal life in heaven. Why so much hatred? directed towards such a positive and loving message. The reason they were so upset is because the message of the gospel, listen carefully, it did not fit their narrative. You see, the gospel by nature is a narrow message. Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and there are few who find it. The gospel only presented one way to salvation through Jesus Christ. And the gospel message calls for repentance and turning from sin and a change of lifestyle. Therefore, the Sadducees, and even some today, despise the gospel message. You see, the Sadducees knew that if the people believed it, it would not only affect their lives, but it would also affect the Sadducees' political position and power and authority over the people. It would likely affect their pocketbook. And so they opposed it, and Peter and John were arrested and thrown into prison for the night. Yet although they persecuted and incarcerated the messengers, the message remained unchanged and continued to spread like wildfire, so much so that the number of disciples grew now to be some 5,000 people. On the following day, Peter and John went from the jail room to the courtroom to stand trial before the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was a 70 member governing body of the Jewish people. It would be the equivalent of standing before today's Supreme Court. This is where they were put. And as the court assembled, Peter and John and the formerly crippled man would have been placed in the center of the room and they would have been surrounded by this glaring governing body prepared to and antagonize, to interrogate, and even prosecute them. Now, there's something to keep in mind, friends, that these were the same men who had crucified Jesus only months earlier. Jesus wasn't given a fair trial. He was guilty in their eyes, even though he was innocent. And these men were corrupt religious politicians who cared very little for the well-being of the people. It's as if Peter and John had been brought before a joint session of Congress and the mafia combined. 
And this powerful group of men were prepared to use intimidation, manipulation, and even physical harm to motivate the apostles to stop preaching their message. And so when the court came together, the judge, jury, and prosecutors cut right to the chase, and they asked this very dangerous question found in verse 7. They said, by what power, by what authority have you done this? The question that they asked had to do with authority. And what made it potentially dangerous was that if their accusers could get them to attribute the healing to any other power than God, even though it was a miracle, they had the power to sentence them to death. Now for a moment, just try to put yourself in Peter's sandals. How would you respond? Here are the same men who had spit in the face of Jesus. They had plucked out his beard. They had scourged him with a cat of nine tails and they had taken him outside the city and crucified him. And here were Peter and John confronted with the same circumstances as their Lord and their response to this question would determine their fate. In that moment, they could either cave into the pressure or they could stand for what was right and tell the truth and let the consequences fall where they may. They could either bend to the political pressure and popular cultural opinion and avoid any backlash or they could boldly proclaim the truth. What would they do in the face of opposition? The truth is that many are caving into the cancel culture movement of today. And I believe that the cancel culture movement will eventually become a movement of cancel the church movement. Why? Because we stand for for the truth and for the one we serve and people don't agree with the message that we preach. And if you think that I'm being presumptuous by making that statement, then you need to look beyond our borders to other parts of the world where right now at this moment, our brothers and sisters are in the midst of severe persecution and imprisonment for preaching this message here today, the message of the gospel. I want you to see Peter's bold response. In verse eight, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, By him, this man stands before you whole. This is the stone which the builders rejected and has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You talk about a response. I imagine that after Peter spoke these words, you could have heard a pin drop. Peter's audience, more than likely, was anticipating an apologetic grovel, a pleading for his life and his release from prison, a plea bargain, perhaps, to drop the charges, followed by a written statement of commitment, never to talk about Jesus again, followed by community service, taking troubled teens out on his fishing boat and teaching them how to to fish. Perhaps his prosecutors thought this fisherman turned preacher would deny the Lord as he had done in the past. They were dead wrong. Peter's response was a spirit-filled response as he began to speak. It says he was filled with the Holy Spirit and it means a new, fresh filling. It doesn't mean that Peter had lost the power and the presence of God that he received at Pentecost. It just means there was a new critical situation that called for a new and fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. And in that moment of his need, God filled him with the Spirit and he began to preach. It was also a respectful response. He called the prosecutors by their titles, rulers, elders. He did not disrespect their position, nor did he acquiesce to it. If you're going to respond, respond in a way that honors God and glorifies the Lord. It was spirit-filled. It was respectful, but it was also very bold. Peter said, this formerly crippled man stands here by the name of Jesus that you crucified. That's pretty bold who God has raised from the dead. 
And it was a biblical response, folks. Peter quotes from Psalm 118, the very same passage of scripture that Jesus quoted from when he was questioned by the religious leaders. This one that you rejected has become the chief cornerstone. God has accomplished his purposes in spite of their opposition. You talk about a mic dropping message. This was it right here. Peter's response was spirit-filled, respectful, bold, biblical, and it was truthful because Peter said in verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other. There is, listen folks, no other name whereby you can be saved. There's only one name that saves. It's the name of Jesus. You can't be saved by adhering to the teachings of Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, or atheism, or any other ism. You can only be saved from eternal separation of God in hell through the name and through the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the good news, friend. You can be saved. This week, I presided over two separate funerals. And in each memorial, I came to the realization once again that life is very short. And I also realized that there is only one hope for life in heaven beyond the grave, and that's Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I urge you to turn from your sin and repent and receive Christ. God loves you. That's why he sent his only son to die for you. And if you will accept him, you'll have your sins forgiven and you'll be on your way to heaven. He is not one of many ways. He is the only exclusive way. And Peter drove home this final point. And in effect, he was saying, the king that you killed is actually alive again. He is God and you must come to him and no other for salvation. That was what he preached. Now, when the Supreme Court of the Sadducees heard this, (laughs) what are they gonna do with these kind of men? The intimidation factor, it wasn't working. The manipulation factor, ineffective. So they decided to call for a brief recess and deliberate among themselves. And during that time of deliberation, they came to realize several things. In verse 13, it says, they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They perceived that they were uneducated and untrained. They marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. What did they realize? First of all, they recognized their courage that these men were bold in the face of opposition. They could see them standing with this faith and this courage. Do you have courage today to stand for Christ? We often say around here, courage is contagious. Fear is contagious, but so is courage. Stand fast in Christ today. They also perceived they were uneducated. They were untrained, meaning they hadn't studied at the most prominent rabbinical schools of the day, They hadn't sat of the most prominent teachers. These guys were fishermen. They also marveled, meaning they were shocked at the courage and the fact that they were untrained fishermen. And yet they could be so biblically astute and unflinchingly bold. And then it dawned on them. They came to a realization, an epiphany, if you would. What did they realize? Here's what they realized. These men had been with Jesus they could see Jesus coming through these men. These men were ministering outside of their natural giftedness. They were ministering outside of their abilities. It was Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit through them. They could see that they had been with Jesus. Friends, let me ask you this morning, in face of opposition of this world, can they see that we have been with Jesus? Is Jesus able to get through? Are they seeing it? Is it clear to this world? Can they identify something different about you? And what's different about you is you've been with Jesus. Can they see it? These men were unwilling to compromise. They had been with Jesus. During this temporary recess of the court, they reached a verdict. I mean, you got a crippled man who is obviously miraculously healed standing in front of them. You got the number of disciples that's now grown beyond 5,000. And so here's what the court decided to do. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna threaten them to threaten them. And here's what they said. They said that it spreads no further. Let us severely threaten them. And from now on, they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and they commanded them, mandated, put it into legislation, not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. In order to stop the message of the gospel from spreading, they decided 
to severely threaten them. And make no mistake, these weren't idle threats. These guys had the power to back up their words and to follow through. They commanded the apostles not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. In other words, they were saying, this today is the end of your ministry. No more talk about Jesus. You're no longer allowed to speak in the name of Jesus. You can speak in any other name. You can champion any other cause that we agree with, but that's it. You can't speak in the name of Jesus. You can't worship in the name of Jesus. We are issuing you a command, a mandate that clearly says no more talking about Jesus. It stops right here. And if you continue, you will suffer the consequences. Now at this point, it would have been very easy for these two uneducated and untrained men to just keep quiet in the trial, to leave the courtroom and just say, that's fine. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. We, you'll never hear from us again. But instead... They openly rejected the Sanhedrin's gag order stating their intention to continue proclaiming the risen Jesus as Messiah. Peter says in verse 19, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you have to judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Respectfully, Peter and John responded that they could not obey the order that they had been given to stop speaking about Jesus. They had been given a command from Jesus to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. They had to testify of what they were eyewitnesses to and that could not be stopped. And therefore they chose to obey God rather than man. As Christians, I believe that we are to be the most outstanding, upright, model citizens within a country, and within a community. We're to be examples for others to follow. I believe that the authorities that are placed over us are there for a reason, and we are to respect their position. However, I also believe that there comes a point when our allegiance to God takes precedent over the authority of men. And when given the choice to obey God or to obey man, we must always obey God. There is a higher authority. There is a higher law that we must answer to. It's the law of God. We cannot stop meeting as a church. We cannot stop singing and worshiping as a church. We cannot stop praying as a church, nor will we stop preaching the message of the gospel. Think about it, friend. There are those in our world today who are very bold and outspoken in championing their causes, some of which are very destructive. They're unafraid. And they are offensively demonstrating so often, shouting their claims, often belligerently, disrespectfully. They proclaim unashamed what they believe. How can we as a church today cower in fear and not stand for the truth when we have the real and only solution to the problems of this world? We have the gospel. <laughs> Friend, listen carefully. The cure... For this culture is Christ and him crucified. The message of the gospel. That's the cure for the culture. That is what people need today. Jesus, he is the answer. With that, we'll draw another A Daily Walk to a close. Pastor John Randall has been showing us how to face opposition with Acts chapter 4 in view. Did you join us late or just want to share this message with a loved one? Hear the program again at adailywalk.org and then share the content with friends and family. You can also hear John's messages through our free app. You know, this is a great way to listen to current and past teachings from Pastor John. Search for Calvary South OC. And another option is to request a CD from us. You can order by phone at 877 242 0828. The question is, has this ministry blessed and encouraged you in your daily walk? If so, we'd like to know. You can email us at a daily walk at gmail.com. Again, that's a daily walk at gmail.com. 
Here in the month of May, we picked out a resource we think moms will benefit from. It's the 20 hardest questions every mom faces. In a warm and personal style, Dana Gresh delivers biblically based wisdom to help moms think through 20 of the most difficult questions confronting moms today. Ask for a copy when you support A Daily Walk today. Get an extra copy to give to your mom, too. It's available for the cost of $9. Ordering is really easy online at adailywalk.org or just call 877-242-0828. Please remember us in your prayers and giving to the Lord. We want to help as many people as possible in their daily walk through the teaching of God's Word. And you can help to make that possible through either a one-time gift or ongoing monthly support. Donations can be made online rather easily and securely at adailywalk.org or call 877-242-0828. We'll be right back here next time on A Daily Walk with another study from God's Word to help you in your daily walk. God bless. A Daily Walk is a presentation of Calvary South O.C.